Well, good morning. How are the saints in Mount Pleasant doing today? You know, Psalms 30, verse 4 says, Let all ye saints praise the Lord. And I want to, um, anyway, I'm David Sturm. I work at Pacific Press Publishing. And um, I'm going to give my testimony. And uh, the sermon title is Searching for God. There's a lot of people in the world searching for God. I look over my life when I was young. See, I want to think, I didn't grow up in the Adventist church. I didn't grow up in no church. There's a, and um, I know that um, there's a lot of people in the world that there's a lot of people searching for God. There's a lot of confusion in the world about God and who he is and what he's like. So it's my burden to reach these people because I know that God has more of his people still wandering around the world than we have in our church. They just don't know about it yet. It's up to us to let them know that God will deliver them and give them a new life. I'll give you a little testimony and tell you what took place to cause me what I'm doing. Starting on in life, I was born in Illinois, but I didn't grow up there. I'm the youngest one in the family. Around 1947, when I was like three years old, we moved to Southern California to the Mojave Desert. I don't know how we got there. Over near Lancaster, Palmdale, it's by uh, an Edwards Air Force Base. And, um, and anyway, and so, but anyway, uh, I was telling you, we never went to church. Uh, now, my mother believed, as I got to be a little bit older, my mother believed very strong in God. She used to, in the evening, quite a bit, she'd sit in a rocking chair and read the Bible. Sometimes she would tell me things about God. She'd tell me things, what to do when I grow up, and this type of thing. And once in a while, she, she would tell me, when I grow up, not to drink. That's because my dad drank, but he, he supported us. We didn't do that like a lot of families that have that problem, but she said it was better not to do it. And uh, so as, anyway, as time went, got, went on, as I got to be older, um, from the time I was 11, 12, 13, I believed very strong in God, but we didn't go to church. You just follow God in your own way. And even though your prayers are crude, God understands because he knows your life. And I look back on it now. I, uh, you know... <laughs> I didn't realize back then, even though I didn't go to church or ever or nothing, that I had a very good relationship with God. I sang praises to God in my heart. I just had a very good relationship with God. So as time went by, now my mother died and I was almost 14 years old. And then after that, I still believed in God. And I get, as I got to be a little bit older, I was always running to people that were Christians invite me to church. Well, the churches I went to back in those days preached a lot of hellfire and brimstone. And then, uh, then I, then I, um, I done. I ended up doing. My mother told me not to do, and that's the drinking part. While I was yet a teenager. Well, I got to be old enough. I, uh, I went into the army. And I started out in Fort Ord, California. Then I was in Fort Campbell, Kentucky. It was 1962, and we. I was in there. They had the Cuban Missile Crisis. It almost started a war. And I started thinking about it. And I think, well, um, what if we uh, had a war? What if I got killed? I used to wonder what heaven is like, and I used to worry about what hell is like with all those hell, hellfire and brimstone I've been hearing about. Because, see, I'm a believer that believes very strong in God, and I believe God is going to do what he says he's going to do. I just didn't understand it. So I brought this little Bible. This is a very important Bible to me. That's the first Bible I had in my life. They give you one of these, you can go into the service. So I thought I'd better start reading it more and learning more about God. Well, in the back of this Bible, it talks about being a sinner and what God can do about it. So I read these things. And it says, My decision to receive Christ my Savior, confessing to God that I'm a sinner, believing like that the Lord Jesus Christ died for me on the cross and raised my justification. I do now receive him as my personal Savior. And I signed it and dated it December 3rd, 1962. Now, I was so serious about this. It was like a baptism. But at the same time, I had no church. I still drank part of the time. I wanted to be a Christian. But this is what we need to understand where we're going to people in the world that God takes people where they're at. And, and, and back in those days, I didn't know where I was at in life. I didn't know where I was going. I didn't know I was being led anywhere. So after this Cuban Missile Crisis blew over, they sent me to Fort Campbell, Kentucky. That's where the 101st Airborne's at. And I went there. I, I was there uh, until I got out in the end of 64. 
And I still was always, I went to Nashville a lot because it's 50 miles from there. I was always meeting these wonderful Christian girls, and that's what I got. More hellfire and brimstone. But anyway, <laughs> so after I got out of the Army, I returned back. I, I stopped, the, I went up to Illinois. I have a sister that still lives there, and I stopped and seen her. Then I went back to the Mojave Desert where I grew up. About that time, I had a brother move over by San Bernardino Riverside area. I went to go stay, visit him. I ended up staying there for a little while. I went to work for a nursery doing landscaping. Now, my brother and sister in law were very involved with church. They taught Sunday school and everything like that. And so I went to church and I told my brother, I said, I'm confused about what? I said, I want to follow God and go to the right church. I said, I've been to a lot of churches. They all tell me they're God's true church. I said, Is this God's church you're going to? He said, I don't know. He said, Find one you like and go there. I said, Okay. So, anyway, <laughs> so the following Friday after work, I went up, see, it's only about, it's about uh, from uh, like San Bernardino up by Lancaster, uh, uh, Roseman, Lancaster, around close to about 90 miles or something, by Edwards Air Force Base. I had a sister still there, and she had a boyfriend in the Air Force, and he come, they come with their buddies who like to drink. So that's what happened. It came, became Sunday night, late at night, and I said, I need to go to San Bernardino. I got to go back to San Bernardino to work tomorrow. Well, I don't know what I was doing driving. I faintly remember leaving. I don't know how I got halfway back there. I don't know how I got through Palmdale. Back then, Palmdale now is 200,000. Back then, it was 3,500 people, one blinking light. But anyway, it's one highway 138. I didn't know the police were after me. They said I was going like 100 miles an hour. I didn't know anything. The only thing I remember is waking up in the road yelling, God save me. I thought I was dying. I couldn't open my eyes. I thought they were full of sand. It wasn't. It was ground glass. My whole face was scraped. I had kind of a sore hip. And I, I faintly remember laying in the back of the police car waiting for an ambulance. And then uh, and my brother came and got me and took me to the hospital. I didn't know what really took place the next day. I rear-ended a huge truck. It rolled the truck. My, some of you older people remember a car named DeSoto. And, well, they quit making them 55. I had a 54 DeSoto. Well, it was a hard, it made a convertible out of it. It shaved the top off, then shaved the manifold off the motor. My brother and I went to work, look at the junkyard a few days later. Uh, and, and the steering wheel and dash was to the front seat going to the back seat. And it's kind of scared me. I was out of it. But anyway, I, I, the guy told me, you can be thankful you're walking your own life. And I was. I knew the first thing I worried about that my drinking killed some, kill someone. The man in the truck didn't kill you, he just got hurt a little bit, so I felt better. And then after that, I, I was a little bit sore, so I couldn't work for two or three weeks. I was kind of sore from this accident. About that time, I had a sister move to a town called Lodi, California. I don't know, does anybody here know where Lodi is? Between Stockton and Sacramento. She said, come up here, there's work. So I took a bus to Lodi, I didn't have a car anymore. Well. I did have insurance, we just lied, at least it paid for the accident. Okay, I go to Lodi. Now, if anybody here knows anything about Lodi, California, back around 19, almost 1965, you cannot live there too long without hearing about, hearing about Adventists one way or another. Because the town's like 25,000 people, and they have two Adventist churches, like with 1,000 members each. And they have a 12th grade school called Lodi Academy. And so uh, I was around Riverside, San Bernardino, long enough to run into them. But anyway, I go to Lodi. So anyway, I get. When I get better, I start looking for work. And I used to do this landscaping work, so I, I went to unemployment office. I'm looking for work, and they sent me to this man, and he hired me. And I noticed he was different. I know he's happy and enjoyed living. I noticed he carried a Bible with him to work, and he, he and he noticed I didn't. He didn't preach to me or nothing, and uh, uh, and he asked me. He said, "I know you don't smoke. Are you a Christian?" I said, well, "I believe in God. I don't belong to any church. I just never did like smoking." He didn't say any more, but the rest of the week, I tell you, just happy to be alive on earth, you know? So it comes Friday, close to quitting time. I said, we're going to work tomorrow. He said, no, we go to, I go to church. I said, what? I said, why do you go to church on Sunday, Saturday? For? He said, why do you go Sunday? Everybody else goes that day. He showed me about the Sabbath day. I said, they call Sunday the Sabbath day. He showed me everything in the Bible about the Sabbath day. He said, well, I'll tell you. He said, how would you like to come to church once? He said, if you don't like it, you don't have to come back. I said, I'll come. I've been to a lot of churches. So it was at the end of November 64th, and his wife come and picked me up and brought me to church. Now, I don't know what it was about. The only thing I knew at this time, you went to church on Saturday. I don't know if it's whether they had Sabbath school or church or just what it was, but I, I liked it, and I kept going. Well, they kept picking me up. I would have came my own, but anyway, I kept going. 
And then uh, in January of 65, uh, HMS Richards Jr., he started having evangelist meetings in Stockton, really close to there. And I went to about every one of these meetings. I was getting so excited about the thing I was doing, especially to stay the dead. That one gave me a lot of peace. But everything was making sense. But here's the wonderful thing about God. Not only did he save your life by accident, you get your new life. Just like the lost sheep, you're lost, you're found, you're dead, you're dead and he gives your life, he gives it to you now. He said, I'll write my law in your heart, you're a new person. He changes your heart, makes you a new person before you ever change your own life, and as you walk with him, you learn. Now, I want, uh, so, uh, I want to go back to scripture reading a minute, because I didn't understand this thing. When it says, as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. I thought, what in the world is that talking about? I already knew that Jesus was our Savior. I already knew he died on the cross for our sins. But what does it mean as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert? So I looked later, I looked it up to find out what took place when Moses looked up, lifted up the snake in the desert. And the story is number 21 from verse 5 to 9, nine mainly, mainly. Okay, the children of Israel were let out of bondage in the wilderness and they're complaining. We're sick of this food. We're sick of this. We're sick of that. We're from Egypt. They, the snakes are already there. So they got, uh, uh, the snakes started biting them. The Bible says, I think, they, it says many were dying. There were so many dying, I thought they were going to be wiped out, and they came to their senses. And they came to Moses and said, we'd like to know if you'll pray to God and ask him to take those snakes away. And, 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 and Moses said, went and prayed, and they thought Moses would pray and they'd be gone. Well, God told him what to do about it. He's a make an image of the snake that's biting them out of brass and put it on a pole and raise it up. Whoever gets bit, when they look at it, they'll be healed. If someone got bit, they're ready to die, and they had to carry him, so they looked at it, healed just like this. But the Bible commentaries do, does say they had that faith to heal, and they looked at it, it wouldn't have been healed, but they knew that was their way back to God, and they knew that it represented Jesus coming and dying for them someday. But what does this have to do with us? Just like they knew, a shadow of a doubt, they looked into that and gave them life. We know the shadow of a doubt. We're looking to Jesus, and we have eternal life because God has promised it. Do you know it says in the book Steps of Christ, you don't have to know, feel you're saved through Jesus. You can claim it as a promise. Here's what happens. You get, you get serious about God. You give up things of the world. You get baptized. And you start to be a new born-again Christian. It says in Steps of Christ, when you accept Jesus and you get baptized, he says, I'll cast your sins to the bottom of the sea, I'll remember them no more. You start out in life as a new born-again Christian that's never sinned, even though you still have a sinful nature, because you're under Jesus' robe of righteousness. Here's what it says happens also in Steps of Christ. It said, when you get baptized and you start this new walk with God as a new born-again Christian, new born again Christian, then Satan comes along and says, well, now that you're saved through Jesus, now you've got to prove yourselves worthy of being saved. So he tries to get your relationship, your relationship to God becomes to be on legalism and works. Legalism and works is bondage and it don't set you free. You're already set free. You don't keep him to be saved. You keep him he's already saved you. And then you can live a victorious life, living under his robe of righteous the rest of your life. Now I want to tell you something. If you're, God knows our hearts. If we're striving to follow God, and, do, you know, I'm saying, we have a sinful nature. He says, if you fall, I'll pick you back up. Because he's already, see, we have a problem. Of what, what, what our problem is, we don't feel worthy or good enough to, to be saved. So we keep begging God to forgive us for something he's already forgiven us for. He says, I have forgiven you. Also, as the... Um, and Psalms 91, that a thousand shall fall at thy side and 10,000 at thy right hand will not come near you because you've made the Lord your habitation. Because the battle's not ours, the battle's his. He fights our battles for us. And then we can have peace. We can't have peace with God if we feel we're under the bondage of the law. He set us free from that. I'd like to say more and go back to Lodi. I was so excited about these things I was learning. I, I didn't wait until I joined the church. I started witnessing immediately. I showed my, church, my, my, my sister, look at it, about the Sabbath day, the stay of the dead. Oh, oh, the stay of the dead gave me a lot of peace. <laughs> Learn the truth about that. And my sister just joined another church. She wasn't interested. I'm the baby of the family. She didn't think I knew what I was doing. But anyway, I had a brother and sister-in-law that moved up to Medford, Oregon. Well, it was the army. They came down the Lodi to visit in 1967, and uh, my sister-in-law, she accepted it right away. But see, her and I were very good friends. I knew her since she was 12 years old. We used to talk about the Bible a lot together. And, and uh, her dad used to be a Baptist preacher, and so we got that stuff, you know. But anyway, uh, 
So she joined it about six or seven years later, my brother finally joined. But anyway, I went up to Medford later to visit him. The Medford Grants Pass area is a really nice area. I thought I'll try to move up there and do my own landscaping business, which I went to do. And I went there in the fall of the year on November, and they were building the, the landscape in New City Hall. The company out of Portland done it. And they, and they, they, anyway, it took a month and a half, but they talked me into moving to Portland and working for them. I went up there and it drizzled all winter. <laughs> I'm used to the Mojave Desert. We get flash floods and stuff. We don't get everything all winter. But anyway, so I didn't, I moved, I didn't, stay, I ended up not staying there. I moved around and I didn't settle down until 1974 when I moved to Caldwell, Idaho. It's over near Boise. We have a church school or Gem State Academy. It's a boarding school. Well, you can't do landscaping work in the winter. It's a sea, it's, I got all four seasons there. So I, uh, what I've done is I started this little wholesale florist business. I used to go around selling things to florists and uh, taxidermists and nurseries and things like that to have work year-round. But ever since the time that God had saved my life in the Mojave Desert, sent me up to Lodi, I always had a burden to do some kind of evangelism. What do you have to do to be an evangelist? Well, you just be a Christian in everyday life and you're an evangelist. You don't have to have an office in church. You don't, all you have to do is be a child of God. We're here, and we're on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week to minister to people come our way. Treat a stranger as a long-lost family member and let them know they found home. And so anyway, I used to get these Steps to Christ back then, the little paperback guns were 10 cents a piece. I'd get three or 400 and boxes, 100 in a box, you know. I'd leave them, I, I used to pick up hitchhikers. I'd give them, a, there was a, I'm not gonna, there was a neat experience I had, but I don't have time to tell it. But anyway, I'd leave them for motel maids and things like this. Well, over the last uh, 40 years, that before, I went to, before I went to work at the press, I had several people that got converted with Steps to Christ. During the years I was traveling around doing these things, in 1983, we had first heard mention that Pacific Press was thinking about moving. They had been in the San Francisco Bay Area for over 100 years. They, they come to a, plant, a point they had to move or close. They looked around, they, they talked about closing, they talked about merging and review, and they looked around the West, but they chose, they looked at about the Tucson, different places, or Washington. They chose to move to the Boise area. They moved there in 84. It doesn't seem possible. They've been there 31 years. And whoever thought that 30 years later, Review would close and merge with them. But anyway, they got going and doing good. So I had a burden. I thought, boy, it'd be so nice to go to work here. If I go to work, you don't have to travel no more. They work four days a week, 10 and 12 hours a day. You get a three-day weekend every weekend. But I didn't have no experience, I didn't have no openings then. So time flies by, it gets to be 1988, and I thought, boy, if I don't go to work there soon, I'll never go to work there. Well, I have a friend that went to the same church I did that worked in the press room. I'm talking a little bit fast, I'm looking at the clock. But anyway, <laughs> he told me, he said, someone is gonna be leaving the press room soon. You ought to try to get the job before they find someone else. I said, okay. So I went back, they didn't act like they didn't want to hire me, like I was too old, and this was, you know, uh, like 27 years ago or something. And <laughs> the press that prints this magazine, it prints 30,000 an hour. That's almost nine of these every second. And you, this web press, it takes four to five people to run them, and you can have to make corrections while it runs. You have to think fast and move fast. Well, they wanted to hire a young man and train him. And when you're young, you can think faster and move faster. Why they train someone to work life is half over? But the man I was talking to, I said, why don't you, ha can you hire someone in their mid-40s? I said, I'll tell you what. I said, let me work in here for one week. I said, if I can't do the job or handle it, you don't have to pay me. I'll donate my time. So, oh, okay, well, that's all right. I'll give you a chance to work here. So I worked there in April of 88. Now, here's the third thing. I've been going to Adventist, I've been going to Adventist Church since November of 64. But never until the time, I, I knew there were signs of time existed, but I never, ever got it or nothing because Steps to Christ is the only book I ever handed out to a new person. So it came time to print signs. I thought, boy, that's a good magazine for the world. So immediately I started sending it to all my family and friends. Okay, time goes by. Three months later, I get in full time. It gets to be 91, nothing great happening, everyday life, nice, peaceful place to work. But one day, uh, one of my sisters called me. She's the same one who used to live in Lodi. She called me to tell me how much she liked this magazine articles in it. That made me excited. But right after that, I had a bigger surprise. I had another, another sister that called me as in Ventura, California. She's my oldest sister. She's uh, 20 years older than I am. And she called me, tell me she liked it. So after they called me, I started getting excited. 
Now, I have a sister in Illinois. She's 18 years older than I am. When we moved to California in 47, she's already married, so she stayed there. So she didn't know who was sending her signs, so I called her. I said, I'm sending you a book, Signs of Times. I talked to her. I said, do you like the magazine? You want me to quit sending it? She said, quit sending it. It's my favorite magazine. So I started getting more excited. Now, I grew up by Roseman, Lancaster, California. I went to a, a library and got a phone book from that area. And I looked up the ones I grew up with, I went to school with, never moved away, neighbors, and I started sending signs to them. I called one of my friends one night. He wasn't home. I talked to his wife. She also told me she liked it. She wanted to keep getting it. By now, I was extremely excited. I started asking all kinds of questions. How long have you been printing signs? Whose idea was it? Who was the first editor? And they thought, what's this new man so excited about something we had for over 100 years for? <laughs> but we get in these ruts. You know, when I started going to this, going to this church in 64, I thought Jesus was going to come by 1980, and here it's 2015, and we're still here. Do you see where we're headed soon? Do you see the world collapsing? I could say a lot, but I don't have time to say anything. But, but the thing is, we are almost there. I'm serious. The things they're legalizing is the signs of the end of time. But anyway, they start giving me answers. Thought, it was originally James White's idea. He was the first editor. So what they'd done, they gave me a copy of the first signs printed. I always share one. This is the first signs printed. It's uh, June 4 of 1874. This is a very interesting article on how wicked the world is. There was a very interesting article, a little poem about shake the dust off and get busy type of thing. It starts out to say, we give below a startling description of the state of the church of the world going and talks about it. And then it says, it's the front page of eight pages, it says to be continued. So I asked for the first 16 pages, I could finish reading it, well they had to go in the vault and get them out, they done it, they done it. Now, back then, they didn't have their own, this is in the West, they didn't have their own publishing stuff yet home publishing house. This is done at an outside shop. They wanted their own publishing house. So four months later, in October of 1874, they had a camp meeting in a town called Yountville, California, where about 400 people came to this camp meeting. The main purpose for camp meeting that year was to raise money and start their own publishing house. They raised over $19,000, which was a lot of money then, and the first one started in Oakland. Now, and uh, James White always referred to signs, uh, signs as a silent preacher. He said it does a pr the work a preacher can't do because what it does is brings people to the preacher. And, they, and, and so uh, if you were to visit Yountville, California Church today, it is called Science Memorial Church. So here's where I was at in life. I was excited about signs. My family and friends were liking it, and I, and I had a burden for it. I didn't know what to do. So I started donating money to Science World Evangelism. Gary Grimes, who's retired now, he's in charge of that. One day he came on the press room and said, why do you give him money to this? I said, because I'm excited about science. My family and friends are like us. So I have a burden to help science. Well, he goes away happy or something. But what he didn't know, or know what the press knew, I can't explain this. God put a very strong burden on me. He wanted me to do more than give him money. But how do you know what to do? Unless something falls in your lap. I don't know nothing about this stuff. Well, uh, one day, uh, well, what I was doing, every morning, see, we have a prayer room at the press. But I didn't have time to put a prayer room. If that press runs 10 hours, you have to hang on for 10 hours. If you have to go to the restroom, someone can watch your place for a minute. So they have this, these rolls of pa these paper, this glossy paper, they have two rolls that one, run at one time that weigh a ton each. And, and anyway, um, they're in the storage room, they have hundreds of rolls, pillars of papers, hundreds of rolls, these big stacks of papers. Every morning, when they were getting this press ready to get started, in amongst those pray, pray, paper rolls was my prayer room. I would talk to God about this. I said, I have no idea what you want me to do about signs other than give them money. There's anything I know to do. If you want me to do anything more than this, you make it, make it known somehow, work upon the hearts of people who are depressed or something, because I have no idea what you want me to do. It's amazing the way God works. He don't always, always perform miraculous miracles. We don't always hear voices and things like this. The thing is, what, what we have, what we need to do, do God's work, just start doing it. Well, it, all these things, it was April of 91. All these things I told you happened in the first four months of 91. My sisters called me everything. It was April of 91. One day the press was stopped. And ABC, we have an AB bookstore in the lobby of the press, so I went there to get something. For the first time in my life, I seen one of these boxes set in there. Gary Grimes got one he had set in there wondering what to do with it. And immediately, as soon as I seen that box, I said, now that's one of the best things that signs ever come up with. And I immediately went to him and ordered two of them. When you order these, it takes two to four months to get them. So I put my order in. Meanwhile, while I was waiting for my boxes, I was happy about something. I know I was happy about it. I was happy about it anyway. So anyway, um, 
I, uh, I went to the Eagle Idaho Church then. I borrowed the box from the church to show to my church. I said, when this, these boxes come, I'm going to give them to the church if you can help me get the magazine. He said, okay. Meanwhile, I wait, while I was waiting to get my boxes, camp meetings started in June. The conf- uh, Gary Grimes is up on the platform telling about it. He said, we like every church in the conference to have one. He's around 40. See, e- Southern Idaho and Eastern Oregon is an Idaho conference. Northern Idaho is in Upper Columbia, Washington. But anyway, so they raised enough money to buy boxes for every church. And he ordered them. Meanwhile, while we were getting the boxes, that, that caught, uh, I was excited about this, you know. And uh, I thought, man, I, I thought, well, man, okay. So I talked to the conference president. And I talked to her president to press. I said, now, when the conference gets those boxes and send them to the churches, I said, it'd be nice if someone could go there, help them place their box, tell them more about, tell them more about science, help them place their box, get them going. I said, I was next year, half of those would be could be in a back room somewhere. I said, oh, that's a good idea, you can go. But I had one little problem, I never spoken in church before. Back in 91, when they asked me, if they asked me to give them a mission report in Sabbath school, I shook in my boots, and I did shake in my boots. The day I borrowed the box from the press, I was so nervous I could hardly talk. My wife thought I was gonna faint. She said, I know it's such a red face. My, the pastor thought I was gonna faint here. I'm not in a church service. My wife said, what in the world's gone wrong with you? I said, you know I have a burden for signs. I said, I, I'm gonna, what I'm going to do, I said, I'll go every other week. When the, I'll go, you one week, I'll do this one week. And I started going in real small churches first because I was nervous. And so <laughs> the boxes came in August of 91. So in Nestor 91 and most of 92, I went out every other week to churches. My first church was, uh, I went to real small ones, uh, Weezer, Idaho, and Burns, Oregon, my first two churches. Now, my, I started seeing silent preacher stories right away. There's several things about the silent preacher. Every magazine has a Bible study card in it. Well, and uh, so, um, um, so anyway, my third church is be over on the other side of Twin Falls by Burley and Rupert, a town called Hayburn. I was supposed to go there in November of 91 and have the church service. The ca- pastor called me at the press and chose these, changed his mind and told me not to come to church. He said, well, we have a, a church of 50 members. We have a church school. We have a real tight budget. He said, even though the box is free, we can't afford to buy the magazines for it. Magazines for it. He sent it back to the conference. Don't come. No big deal. I'm not going. I didn't think nothing of it. Well, God must have thought something of it. I go home from work that night, and I'm watching the 10 o'clock news. On the news, they were talking about Satan worship in Minidoka County, which is Burley and Rupert. They were showing all the problems they're having this thing. They showed the mirror of Rupert, the big auditorium full of people, Christians of all denominations came together to pray about this problem. I told my wife, they need signs and the pastor told me not to come. So I go to work the next day. I didn't call the pastor back. I got information. I called the mayor of Rupert. I said, I see what's happening there. I said, we have a Christian magazine called Signs of the Times. I, I said, we, uh, we put them in a newspaper box. We put them in stores and place for anybody wants to. He said, oh, that's a good idea. I think I know you can put one. I said, good. So I called the pastor back. I told the pastor to watch the news. I said, also, the mayor of Rupert said he wants signs there. So he told me to get the box and bring it back. I went there two days after Thanksgiving 91, went to Smith's Food King Superstore. Next year, he had over 20 requests for Bible studies. There's a little bitty town called Eden, Idaho, close to there. The town's uh, only like 400 people. They had a five-member church we put at the post office. They had some evangelists. And he, stopped me at the, he stopped me at camp meeting the next year to tell me they had some evangelist meetings and nine got baptized. But part of them came from this, because they put a little advertisement about the meetings in here, stepping stone the meetings. And then in 92, it had over 200 requests Idaho conference. And where I go to church in Eagle, a town called Emmett, a man named Alan Thompson wanted Bible studies. His wife didn't want to do them. But he'd done them anyway. August of 92, he got baptized. I went to his baptism. His wife came. But anyway, and he's a very active member in church still. His wife and other family members joined the church because when a person becomes converted, it becomes contagious. And that's what happened to Alan. This is what happened to me. When I seen all this took place, I put two and two together, and I figured out what God wanted me to do. I wrote out a proposal to the president of the press, suggesting to him that this be thrown out throughout, done throughout North America. So immediately, he had the vice president of marketing contact me. Uh, the January 93, I don't work in the press room no more. I have a job of promoting signs throughout North America. I, I, went to church, I went to work there to quit traveling. Now I'm traveling more than ever. But it, does, but it doesn't bother me a bit because it's amazing what I knew God was leading. And, uh, and one of the suggestions I had to the president was when I go to a church, they don't want to make, wait two to four months for a box. They want them now. So I press by 100 at a time. I'll take some with me and take some magazine and get them started. 
So they sent letters to every conference in North America. No one knew who I was. No one really called me. The Gulf states were the first one that did later. But anyway, I had an old 1972 ton truck like a U-Haul. I put 50 of these boxes in it. I put the, a car in a tow dolly with magazines. I headed down to the Mojave Desert in Arizona. And I went to a town called Lake Havasu. I mean, you've ever heard of that? They have the London Bridge there? Did you know that back in 1973 and 4, there was nothing there but a spot in the road? Now it's over 80,000 people. But anyway, they have a church there. The following, they had three baptisms. And then I went to a, on a, a Navajo reservation, Chinle, Arizona, where they had five baptisms. And then I started I going, going other places. I went to Needles, California, Blythe. You know. But anyway, uh, uh, I wanna, now I want to tell you this one. I want to talk about the editor a minute. One time, the, the first, the Gulf States con Conference invited me. I, it was in 95. I was down there. And I, went, I was in Fairhope, Alabama, a suburb of Mobile. And we put one at a super Walmart. But I, by the way, at one time we had these over 200 Walmarts, but Walmart don't allow no boxes anymore. You can't put a real estate in them all come out. But there was them at the, there was this one Christian family that enjoyed picking this up. They called the 800 number in here, said, why do you go to church on Saturday? Why do you believe it's about the state of the dead? I don't want, they show up to church. They liked it, they kept going. About a year later, they went to the Gulf States camp meeting in Mississippi where Marvin Moore was the speaker at camp meeting that year, and he baptized us people at camp meeting. I met these people following year on my way to Florida. The first thing they said to me when I met them, they said, if you wouldn't have this box there, we wouldn't know about this wonderful message. Then I had, they had a lot of baptisms in Florida. But Marvin Moore, I'll tell you, one of the things he does, he goes through almost every one of those 28 fundamental beliefs every year. He does them in articles. Okay, and I want to tell you one real quick, and this I've done very well to get it done at 12. But, in, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> There, that's why I talk faster. But anyway, there was uh, a couple, about two or three years ago, I was in Fox Valley, Wisconsin. See, I have been, since I started, I've been to like 1,600 different churches in the United States. And we put some of these out in Fox Valley, Wisconsin, by, over by Madison, okay? There was this one couple, they were young, they weren't married, like 20 or 21 year old, that their life was in shambles. They were on drugs and alcohol. One day they seen a newspaper box. They took one out of it. They liked it, so they kept getting them. One day, the lady went to a doctor's office for an appointment, and she said a little rack on the wall with signs in it, and she said, um, we get those out of a news box. They started talking to them. They said they told them they had a prayer meeting, and Wednesday night, would they have to come? They said yes. Well, over here, they, this, this couple gave up clean. They got converted. They quit their habits. They got married. And over a year ago, I was down in South Carolina. They were down there being literature evangelists. But they, these things, there's things that, but what I'm saying, this, I'm not going to tell you it's going to, it's not going to convert the world, set the world on fire. It's another way to do evangelism. God knows who these people are in the world. We don't know who they are. They're going to be a homeless person, be anybody. We don't know. People pick, it says signs of time, they pick it up. If they like it, they keep getting it. And so uh, there's a lot of other stories I don't have time to tell them, but... Um, Father in heaven, we thank you for your blessings being enjoyed with us here today. And we talk about evangelism. And we're told when the message shall go to the world and to the uncommon, you use all ways, word of mouth, printed page, radio, television. And I just pray that these boxes that go out and, and uh, the ones that are already out, have your angels continue look, watching them, keeping them safe. And, um, and you know who your people are to send to them. And we know the days we're living, we're in the last days. And so... Be with us the rest of this day, and we praise you and thank you for everything in Jesus' name. Amen.